so a very good evening friends so today we have a session on practice questions in general pediatrics as you all must be aware that pediatrics has two important components general pediatrics which deals with nutrition uh, nutritional disorders immunization vaccines and common pediatric infections whereas systemic pediatrics refers to diseases with regard to the various systems so in this session we will be discussing some important questions from general pediatrics so let's begin this is question number 1 so which of the following vaccines can be given intranasally and your options are live attenuated influenza vaccine b pneumococcal vaccine c je vaccine or d rotavirus vaccine and the correct answer to this question is option number a that is live attenuated influenza vaccine so live attenuated influenza vaccine can be administered intranasally however the vaccine is currently not available in india administration device is a nasal sprayer with a dose divider clip that allows introduction of 0.1 ml of spray into each nares the vaccine need not be repeated if the person coughs or sneezes after administration introduction of low level of vaccine virus into the environment is likely and is unavoidable uh this is one vaccine that can be uh, delivered intranasally there is a drug as well which can be administered intranasally and that is midazolam and intranasal midazolam can be given to parents of children who have seizure disorder so they can give intranasal midazolam in case their child has a seizure at home so before they can take the child to the facility they can at least abort the seizure by using intranasal midazolam so one intranasal vaccine live attenuated influenza vaccine one intranasal drug that is midazolam so question number 2 question number 2 is the shake test is used for a helps determine the usable status of free sensitive vaccine simple rapid bedside method for estimation of fetal lung maturity c both a and b and d only b and the correct answer is option number c that is both a and b so shake test shake test determines the usable status of freeze sensitive vaccine not routinely employed and is done only for suspected vaccine vials to assess whether at any point of time they have been exposed to freezing temperature shake test compares the test vial of the vaccine which is suspected to have frozen during storage or transportation with a control vial of the same type of vaccine and from the same manufacturer and the same batch number and how do we do the shake test to see whether the vaccine is okay or not we take the control vial and it is prepared by storing it at minus 20 degrees celsius overnight and then it is allowed to thaw at normal temperature then during the test both the test and the control vials are shaken and then placed cap side down on the flat surface for 30 minutes so the rate of sedimentation in the test vial is slower than in the control vial then it shows that the vaccine under the test has not been damaged due to freezing now which are the freeze sensitive vaccines well you can remember the freeze sensitive vaccines by the mnemonic t series vaccines so the vaccines which have the t in their name are the usual freeze sensitive vaccines and amongst them the most freeze sensitive is hepatitis b virus hepatitis b vaccine then the other freeze sensitive vaccines are pentavalent vaccine tetanus toxoid dpt vaccine so these are the t series vaccines which are freeze sensitive 
and what is the shake test for rds this i'm sure you must be aware of where you basically see whether the baby is at risk of developing respiratory distress syndrome or not so in shake test for rds you mix 0.5 ml of gastric fluid and it is mixed with equal volume of normal saline thereafter 1 ml of 95% ethanol is added and the mixture is agitated for 15 seconds and this is allowed to stand for 15 minutes and then the air liquid interface is examined for bubbles if there are no bubbles that are present after 15 minutes the test is negative which implies that the child that the that there is very little surfactant that is present and the child is at high risk of developing respiratory distress syndrome however if there are abundant bubble formation at the air liquid interface then that means that there are adequate amounts of surfactant and the child has low risk for developing respiratory distress syndrome so question number 3 question number 3 is tropical pulmonary eosinophilia is caused by all of the following except and your options are a wucheria bancrofti b brugia malai c brugia timori and d loa loa and the correct answer to this question is option number d that is loa loa So what is TPE or tropical pulmonary eosinophilia this is a distinct syndrome that develops in some individuals who are residing in endemic areas and this develops due to certain species which are these three wucheria bancrofti brugia malai and brugia timori so these are the lymphatic filariasis species which result in causation of tropical pulmonary eosinophilia the main features of this disease are history of residence in endemic areas there is paroxysmal cough and wheezing that are usually nocturnal apart from that there may be weight loss low grade fever and some lymphadenopathy as well many a times this condition is confused with bronchial asthma because of the cough that occurs cough and wheezing that occur usually at night the x ray findings may show increased bronchovascular markings and the pft shows restrictive abnormalities in most cases so which is the characteristic pft finding in case of asthma there will be obstructive abnormality whereas in case of tpe you may see restrictive abnormalities in most cases then apart from that there can be certain blood investigations also that may help you to make a diagnosis and these include getting a total serum ige levels which are raised from 10000 to 1 lakh nanogram per ml and patients may have significant peripheral blood eosinophilia almost more than 10 2000 cells per cubic millimeter and anti filarial antibody may also be demonstrated the definitive diagnosis can be made if you demonstrate microfilaria in the blood and for this it is important that blood specimens be taken between 10 pm to 2 am and the drug of choice for this condition is diethylcarbamazine So now we come on to question number 4. Question number 4 is a 4 year old girl is brought by her mother for recent onset fever and rash. On examination the child is afebrile and doesn't appear ill. But there are few palpable suboccipital and posterior auricular lymph nodes. What is the most likely cause of this patient's condition? And the options are A group A beta hemolytic streptococci, B measles virus and c rubella virus and d varicella virus and the correct answer to this question is option number c that is rubella virus so few important points about rubella virus rubella is known as the condition the viral infection is also known as german measles it was also known as third disease which is the fifth disease that is erythema infectiosum and sixth disease is exanthema subitum 
so rubella is third disease and depending upon the age of presentation or age of infection rubella infection is categorized as postnatal rubella infection or acquired rubella or congenital rubella syndrome the acquired rubella infection is a very mild disease it has a incubation period of 14 to 21 days characterized by a normal viral febrile illness characterized by running nose coryza headache and myalgias the enanthum in case of rubella is forshimer spots and tender and enlarged lymph nodes particularly in the suboccipital area may be seen which may last for up to 5 to 8 days so you should also be aware that it is the congenital rubella infection which is quite uh, causes a lot of morbidity in newborn children and this occurs if the primary rubella infection occurs during the first 12 weeks of gestation so this is characterized by multi system abnormalities and can also result in miscarriage fetal death and it is basically to prevent the congenital rubella infection or the congenital rubella syndrome that now vaccination for rubella has also been introduced which is given along with measles and mumps vaccine so many of the states in our country are administering the mmr vaccine so that the uh, the in incidence of congenital rubella infection uh, syndrome can be reduced so question number 5 bull neck is seen in which of the following conditions and your options are a diphtheria b tubercular lymphadenitis c mumps and d goiter and the correct answer to this question is option number a that is diphtheria so the bull neck basically results when the uh, corini bacterium diphtheria has infected the fascial area there is enlarged lymph nodes and along with that the edema of the surrounding tissues causes a bull neck appearance which is characteristic of diphtheria so now we come on to question number 6 Question number 6 is the 23 valent pneumococcal vaccine is recommended in all of the following except and the options are a cerebrospinal fluid leak b chronic cardiac disease c children less than 2 years of age and d nephrotic syndrome and the correct answer to this question is option number c that is children less than 2 years of age so now few important points about the polysac uh, pneumococcal vaccine so two types of pneumococcal vaccines are licensed at present and they are the pneumococcal polysaccharide vaccine and the pneumococcal conjugate vaccine now few important points that you need to know is the pneumococcal polysaccharide vaccine is a t cell independent vaccine and hence it is poorly immunogenic in children less than 2 years of age it has low immune memory and lacks booster effect as well it does not reduce nasopharyngeal carriage and does not provide herd immunity and there is also evidence that has gathered over few years that there is hyporesponsiveness with repeated doses hence not more than two lifetime doses are to be recommended for this vaccine so the polysaccharide vaccine hence is not effective in children less than 2 years of age and hence is not recommended in this age group when it is used in high risk individuals it has to be used along with the conjugate vaccine and following are the medical conditions for which the polysaccharide vaccine along with the conjugate vaccine is indicated in the group 24 to 71 months and these children are immunocompetent children with chronic diseases like congenital heart diseases chronic lung diseases diabetes mellitus and cerebrospinal leaks or cochlear implants children with anatomic or functional asplenia and children with immunocompromised conditions like 
एच आई वी क्रॉनिक किडनी डिजीज नेफ्रोटिक सिंड्रोम एंड चिल्ड्रेन हु आर बींग ट्रीटेड फॉर मैलिग्नेंट न्यूप्लाजम और दोज हु हैव कंजनाइटल इम्यूनोडेफिशियंसी सो दीज दिस इज द ग्रुप ऑफ चिल्ड्रेन वेयर द न्यूमोकोकल वैक्सीन मे बी ऑफ यूज बट द पॉलीसेक्राइड वैक्सीन यूज अलॉन्ग विद द कॉन्जुगेट वैक्सीन सो द करंटली द कॉन्जुगेट वैक्सीन दैट आर अवेलेबल आर PCV10 and PCV13 and these numbers represent the number of serotypes against which polysac uh, the vaccine provides protection against so question number 7 is true about polaki urea is and the correct answer to this question is option number c that is urine of low specific gravity so polaki urea is a benign condition defined as frequent small voids in a previously toilet trained child with no polyuria or evidence of infection so now we come on to question number 8 and you have to identify the syndrome given in the picture so this is the image and these are your options so a eagle barrett syndrome b barrett beadle syndrome c treacher collin syndrome and d charge syndrome so this image is that of a eagle barrett syndrome now if you see the image clearly it is the abdomen where you have to focus so i'm sure you can appreciate the prune like appearance of the abdominal vasculature so this is basically the prune belly syndrome which is also known as eagle barrett syndrome so the prune belly syndrome or the eagle barrett syndrome is a congenital disorder that is characterized by triad of abnormalities which include deficient development of abdominal muscles one second undescended testes and third urinary tract abnormalities including severe obstructive uropathy it is also known as obrinsky syndrome or the triad syndrome so now you know three different names for prune belly syndrome the condition affects males more frequently than females and in addition to the triad of abnormalities patients can also have co associated cardiovascular musculoskeletal genital and pulmonary defects the barrett beadle syndrome on the other hand has vision loss obesity polydactyly intellectual disability abnormalities of the genitalia and hypogonadism and with regard to the treacher collins syndrome you should know the following points first that it is a component of the first arch syndrome second it is a autosomal dominant disorder and one of the constant feature of treacher collins syndrome is coloboma of the lower lid and there is often associated with deformed pinna and deafness is common in case of treacher collins syndrome while the charge syndrome is a acronym for these abnormalities so c stands for coloboma h for heart anomalies a for coronal atresia r for growth retardation g for genital anomalies and e for i or ear anomalies so this is the charge syndrome so question number 9 now we come on to question number 9 question number 9 is all of the following are features of prematurity except and your options are a abundant lanugo b absent sole creases c empty scrotum and d thick ear cartilages and the correct answer is option number d that is thick ear cartilages now i am sure you must be aware that for gestational assessment we now use the new ballard score which has certain physical signs and certain neuromuscular signs so abundant lanugo absent sole creases and empty scrotum are all features of prematurity whereas a thick ear cartilage is a sign which comes as the maturity of the child goes towards term hence this is the correct answer 
So now we come on to question number 10. And question number 10 is, a child can transfer objects from one hand to another and is babbling. He will be able to, and your correct answer is, will show stranger anxiety. So now we come on to question number 11. And question number 11 is, a four-year-old child is brought in by her mother because of a painful honey-colored crusted lesion on her face. The most likely diagnosis is, and the correct answer to this question is B. Impetigo. And this is the image. So, I hope you can appreciate the honey colored crusted lesions here. And this is diagnostic of impetigo. So, impetigo is a bacterial infection that involves the superficial skin. The most common presentation is yellowish crusts on the face or the arms or the legs. It is typically due to either Staph aureus or Streptococcus pyogens. Risk factors include attending daycare, crowding, poor nutrition, diabetes mellitus, contact sports and breaks in the skin as seen from mosquito bites, eczema or scabies. In some places, the condition is also known as cool sores and that is because attending daycare, early school is a risk factor for developing impetigo. So now we come on to question number 12 and question number 12 is false regarding thumb sucking is and your options are A must be treated vigorously in first year of life. It is a sign of insecurity. It is a source of pleasure. Can lead to malocclusion. And the correct answer is option number A. That is must be treated vigorously in first year of life. So thumb sucking is a, a one of the behavioral problems that are seen in the first year of life. But they are not to be treated. This is not to be treated till the time the child is 2 to 3 years of age. This is often a sign of insecurity and once the permanent teeth have started to appear and if the child is still thumb sucking then it may cause malocclusion or can also cause deformity of the shape of the palate. So in this question option number A was the correct answer. So now we come on to question number 13 and question number 13 is all of the following are complications of phototherapy except and your options are a passing green loose stools b hypercalcemia c hyperthermia and d bronze discoloration of skin and the correct answer to this question is option number b because all of the remaining options are complications of phototherapy so the child can pass loose green stools, child can get hyperthermic, there can be bronze discoloration of skin as well but hypocalcemia develops in a child who is on phototherapy and not hypercalcemia. So for phototherapy I am sure you know that this is one of the ways by which serum bilirubin levels in case of newborns can be reduced. The most important mechanism by which phototherapy reduces the bilirubin levels is structural isomerization by which bilirubin is converted into lumirubin which is then excreted in the body. When phototherapy is being administered, the child's eyes and the genitals should be covered so as to avoid damage to these areas. The child's position should be changed frequently so that the entire cutaneous surface gets exposed to the phototherapy and it will aid in reduction of bilirubin levels faster and the most effective wavelength at which phototherapy works is between 425 to 475 nanometers. Now this wavelength question is also asked very frequently in the exam so you should remember the wavelength of the phototherapy unit as well. So question number 14 is the ratio of lung inflation to chest compression in cardiopulmonary resuscitation is 
and the correct answer to this question is option number C that is 1 is to 3. So, I am sure many a times the question comes as chest compression to lung inflation. So, in that case the answer is 3 is to 1 but here the question is lung inflation to chest compressions. So, it is important that you read the question carefully and what is, what is that they are asking. So, in this question the correct answer is 1 is to 3. The ratio of lung inflation to chest compression is 1 is to 3. So, now we come on to question number 15 and question number 15 is exclusive breastfeeding is recommended up to 6 months. However, continued breastfeeding along with complementary feeding is recommended up to and your options are A 9 months, B 12 months, C 18 months or D 24 months and the correct answer to this question is Option number D that is 24 months. So, please do not get confused in this question. Exclusive breastfeeding is still 6 months but once complementary feeds have been added adequately at 6 months, the mother can continue to breastfeed the child till the time the child is 2 years of age. These are the recommendations of the NNF as well as the BPNI that is the Breastfeeding Protection Network of India. So, till 24 months, mother can continue breastfeeding along with appropriate complementary feeding. So, now we come on to question number 16. And question number 16 is, which of the following is not true about late onset hemorrhagic disease of newborn? A begins within 2 to 7 days of life. B, intracranial hemorrhage is common. C, biliary atresia is a common cause. D may be associated with warfarin therapy in mother. So, the correct answer to this question is option number A that it begins between 2 to 7 days of life. So, now few important points about hemorrhagic disease of newborn. So, hemorrhagic disease of newborn was an older nomenclature. Now, the nomenclature that is used is vitamin K deficiency bleeding. And this primarily results because of deficiency of vitamin K. K in the neonate. It can be divided into three groups, the early onset, classical and late onset. In early onset vitamin K deficiency bleeding or hemorrhagic disease of newborn, there may be onset of bleeding sometimes in utero and or sometimes within the first 24 hours of life. Here the risk factors are whenever the mother is on certain drugs which can interfere with the metabolism of vitamin K. So, if the mother is on warfarin therapy, if she is taking any anticonvulsants, then in such a case, the child may be at risk of developing early onset vitamin K deficiency bleeding. Then the classical disease is what is seen between 2 to 7 days of life. So, this primarily results in home delivered babies who have not been administered or supplemented with vitamin K at birth. So, these children may develop classical onset vitamin K deficiency bleeding which is seen between 2 to 7 days of life. Now, children between 4 weeks to 6 months of age can present with late onset HDN or late onset vitamin K deficiency bleeding. In most of these children, always a predisposing condition can be found which can either be a biliary atresia or warfarin therapy in the mother which again will interfere with the vitamin K metabolism in the child. So, the correct answer here was option number A. Late onset disease is seen from 4 weeks to even 6 months of age. Now, we come on to question number 17 and question number 17 is which of the following are considered abnormal in a neonate? And your options are A. Erythema toxicum, B. Mongolian spots, C. Caput succedinium and D. 
jaundice within 24 hours. So this was a simple question. The answer is D, jaundice within 24 hours. So all these conditions, erythema toxicum, Mongolian spots and caput can be seen in a normal newborn. Erythema toxicum never occurs at birth. It is usually seen after 24 hours. There are fluid filled vesicles. If you puncture the vesicles and make a smear, you will find eosinophilic precursors. Mongolian spots, most common site is the lumbosacral area. They disappear by the first birthday. Caput ha has to be distinguished from kephal hematoma. Caput may be present at birth, but kephal is never present at birth. So now we come on to question number 18. And question number 18 is, breast milk can be stored in a refrigerator for how long? And your options are A, 4 hours, B, 8 hours, C, 12 hours and D, 24 hours. So for the storage, these are the hours that you need to remember. So at room temperature, you can store the breast milk for 6 to 8 hours. At the refrigerator, in the refrigerator, you can store for 24 hours. And in the freezer, you can store it for 3 months. So question number 19 is, normal anion gap acidosis is seen in option number A, acute watery diarrhea, B, acute kidney injury, C, diabetic ketoacidosis and D, salicylate poisoning. And the correct answer is option number A, that is acute watery diarrhea. Now, there are just two conditions where you will see normal anion gap acidosis and that is acute watery diarrhea and renal tubular acidosis. In rest of the conditions, increased anion gap acidosis can be remembered by the mnemonic mud piles where M stands for methanol poisoning, U stands for uremia. D stands for diabetic ketoacidosis, P stands for propylene alcohol poisoning, I stands for isoneazide poisoning, L stands for lactic acidosis, E stands for ethanol poisoning and S stands for salicylate poisoning. So normal anion gap acidosis seen only in two conditions and increased Anion gap acidosis can be remembered by the mnemonic mud piles. So now we come on to the last question for the session and that is picket fence temperature is seen in and the options are A meningitis, B lateral sinus thrombosis, C enteric fever and D dengue fever. So the correct answer to this question is option number B that is lateral sinus thrombosis. So picket fence temperature is seen in lateral sinus thrombosis. In dengue fever, you will see saddleback type of fever. So what happens is in saddleback, if you, uh, if you have seen the saddle which is kept on the horse, so the saddle pattern fever is the patient complains they had fever, then the child is normal, there is no fever, there is an afebrile period and the fever rises again. So that is the saddleback pattern of fever which is seen in dengue fever. In enteric fever, you see relative bradycardia. So what is uh, that? Basically, whenever there is high temperature, the child is having fever, there will be a concomitant increase in heart rate as well. So that means there is tachycardia whenever there is fever. But in case of enteric fever, you can have relative bradycardia. So these are few important points you need to know about fever and heart rate. So with this, I come to the end of my session that was scheduled for today, which had practice MCQs in general pediatrics. I hope you would have found this session useful. And for many such practice sessions and for your preparations for the NEET PG exam, you can subscribe to the Unacademy Plus subscription, which will give you Unlimited access to all the live sessions from the uh, top educators of all the 19 subjects. There are dedicated doubt clearing sessions where you can come up with your doubts and get them cleared right away. You will get with one subscription, you get an unlimited access. You also get the opportunity to have real time interaction with your teachers. 
you can also download the videos and can watch them later whenever you have time so i hope to see you again in my next class on the plus an academy plus platform see you i wish you all the best for your exam and i hope an academy plays an important role in your dream of achieving and cracking the neat pg entrance exam wish you good luck and see you in my next class